1,000 years after this Dark Age Anglo-Saxon queen died, archaeologists made an astounding discovery. Archaeologists in Magburg, Germany are about to open a stone tomb in the city's cathedral that's lain undisturbed for 500 years. It's said that this monument contains the remains of Edith of England, Queen of Germany, 1,000 years ago. The researchers know, though, that the strong likelihood is that this ancient grave will be empty. But what they find when they open the lead coffin astonishes them. We'll find out what the archaeologists discovered in that ancient tomb in magnificent Magburg Cathedral shortly. But first let's learn something about this English woman who became the Queen of Germany in 936. In fact, Edith is a modernizing of her name. In Old English, it was the tongue-twisting Edith. But we'll stick with Edith. Born into the House of Wessex in the year 910, Edith could hardly have had a more illustrious genealogy. Her father was Edward the Elder, the English king. Her mother, Alfred, was Edward's second wife. And her grandfather, Alfred's father, was King Alfred the Great, certainly one of the best known of all the English monarchs. Edith was actually one of eight children that Edward and Alfred had together. Notable among her siblings were Eadjifu, who were the king of West Francia, Charles the Simple, and Edhild, who married Duke of the Franks, Hugh the Great. Edith's parents sadly divorced when she was aged just nine or ten. She then joined her mother, who was sent to a monastery, perhaps in the cities of Salisbury or Winchester. The princess's royal pedigree, in fact, went back through the mists of time to the fifth century. Indeed, her royal lineage was said to be the oldest in Europe, stretching back to one Serdic of Wessex. Serdic is said to have been among those who led the Anglo-Saxon conquest of England. And Britain's current monarch, Elizabeth II can also apparently trace her line back to that same ancient ruler. Alfred the Great, born around 848, ruled the anglo saxon of Wessex from about 871 to 886. This territory stretched across the south and west of England before it became a unified land. In fact, Alfred started the process of creating the modern nation of England by expanding the influence of the Wessex kingdom across the country. Strangely, Alfred is famous, not for his expansion of the Wessex kingdom, but for a culinary mishap. The surely apocryphal story is set early in his reign when Wessex was under severe pressure from Viking attacks. The king, it said, escaped a deadly Viking assault on the town of Chippenham in January of 828 by the skin of his teeth. The Danes then put most of the town's folk to the sword. Alfred made good his escape to the levels in Somerset, marshy lands in western England. There, a country woman, ignorant of the fleeing king's identity, gave him shelter. At one point, she left the monarch in charge of some wheat cakes cooking on an open fire. Distracted by the cares of the world, he allowed them to burn. When the woman returned and discovered Alfred's mistake, the ruler felt the sharp edge of her tongue. This is a story that British schoolchildren have heard for generations. And they all take delight in the idea of a commoner scolding a king. But truly, the monarch's real place in history comes from his success in fighting off the Vikings and expanding his kingdom, a precursor of a fully united England. By the time Edith was born in 910, though, her father, Edward, had been on the throne for eleven years following the death of Alfred. Meanwhile, the creation of a united nation was an ongoing project. During the princess's childhood, Edward succeeded in seizing control of most of England, with only the northern territory of Northumbria still under the sway of the Vikings. In 924, Edith's half-brother, Athelstan, succeeded to the English throne after Edward the Elder's death. His mother was Edward's first wife, Egwin, one of the more obscure figures in English royal history. And after Athelstan took the crown of England, European affairs began to impinge on the young woman's life. This happened when Henry the Fowler, King of the East Franks, decided it would be a good idea to unite with the English crown. East Francia occupied territory which now lies in modern Germany. According to legend, the monarch was named the Fowler, because he was engaged in snaring birds when he heard he was to be ruler. Henry then proposed to Athelstan that his eldest son, Otto, marry one of the English king's half-sisters. 
This was one way of strengthening ties between the two kingdoms. The king, in fact, chose two half-sisters for a potential royal wedding, Edith and her sibling Edgava. The pair then traveled to East Francia to meet their potential husband. Once there, Henry's heir simply picked the woman he found most pleasing as his future wife. In those days, royal marriages tended to be matters of high politics rather than romance. Otto evidently preferred Edith, as it was she he chose to marry. And well he might have done. A 2010 article about her in The Guardian quoted the words of 10th century German nun and poet, Hratzwitha of Gandersheim. Describing Edith, Hratzwitha wrote, In fact, she was so very highly regarded in her own country that public opinion unanimously rated her the best woman who existed at that time in England. A glowing tribute indeed, even though no one was likely to utter an unkind word about a princess in 10th century Germany. So Edith and Otto Dooley married in 930. In 936, a stroke killed Henry the Fowler, which may well have been welcome news for Germany's bird population. For Otto, though, it meant that he now became the king of the Franks. And the tidings propelled Edith into the position of Otto's queen at around 25 years old. The Wessex girl was now the queen of Germany, or at any rate, East Francia. Otto I went on to become known as Otto the Great. This accolade came about because of his success continuing Henry's work in uniting the disparate tribes of Germany under his rule. He also took control of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany. And he would go on to become Holy Roman Emperor from 962. But by the time Otto became Holy Roman Emperor, Edith had already been dead for some 16 years. Her unexpected death came when she was only in her middle 30s, in January 946. We don't know a great deal about how the Queen occupied her time on the German throne. It's said, though, that she was active in charitable works involving gifts to various religious institutions. During Edith's reign, she also gave Otto two children, a son and a daughter. Lyodolf was born in 930, the very year the royal couple married. He died of a fever aged only 27 while invading Italy. The daughter, born in 932, was Liotgard. She married Conrad the Red and died in 953 when she was only 22. Early death, it seems, was an occupational hazard of being born in the Middle Ages. Edith was originally interred in the Benedictine Monastery of St. Morris. This was an institution that she and Otto had founded in Magdeburg in 937. St. Morris is believed to have been an Egyptian Christian who served in the Roman army in the 3rd century, rising to the rank of commander of 1,000 legionaries. He later died as a martyr for refusing to attack fellow Christians. But the St. Morris Monastery was not to be Edith's final resting place. Her remains were, in fact, moved three times or more over the years until their re-interment in 1510 at Magdeburg Cathedral. And there they remained as far as anyone knew, for the next 500 years. Then, in 2008, German archaeologists prepared to open her tomb. As we saw earlier, the strong assumption was that her tomb would actually be empty. Researchers thought it was likely to be a cenotaph, a memorial with no actual remains inside. The scientists first opened the stone sarcophagus. Inside that was a lead coffin and the coffin had a Latin inscription on its lid. The inscription read Edit Regine Sine Rishiak Sarcophagus Hibet, which translates as the remains of Queen Egypt are in this sarcophagus, and once the archaeologists opened the lead coffin, much to their amazement, they did indeed find human remains. A remarkably well-preserved shroud of fine silk cover the ancient bones. In the 2010 Guardian piece, historian and author Michael would describe what the researchers found in the coffin. Under the crumpled folds was a small, slim frame, slightly bent at the knees, like a child asleep, he wrote. But this was not enough to convince scientists that the remains were definitely those of Edith. A 2010 article on the University of Bristol website quoted Professor Harald Meller, project director from the German Saxony Anhalt Heritage Management and Archaeology State Office. He described the uncertainties that surround archaeological finds such as this. The professor also pointed out the difficulty of being sure of a particular identity for the bones, 
medieval bones were moved frequently and often mixed up. So it required some exceptional science to prove that they are indeed those of Edith, the professor said. That meant the next step in matching these bones to the historical figure required some high-tech scientific analysis. First stop for the remains was Germany's University of Mainz. In Mainz, Professor Kurt Alt examined the bones and was able to state categorically that they belonged to one female for whom death had come between the ages of 30 and 40. Alt was even able to say that one of the thigh bones offered strong evidence that she often rode horses. That meant the woman was more than likely from the upper echelon of her society. Just like Edith, it's worth noting that the skeleton of the woman from the Magburg lead coffin was far from complete. The feet hands and a large portion of the skull were not present. Scientists think the bones perhaps fell foul to a common practice in medieval times, removal and use as relics. But further analysis of the bones required that the remains travel to England. If the skeleton did indeed belong to Edith, it would be her first visit to the country of her birth for more than 1,000 years. The remains from the coffin in the Magburg Cathedral then made their way to the University of Bristol. Bristol University was the place where staff had the necessary expertise and equipment to perform an in-depth analysis of the ancient remains. Initial investigations, though, were not encouraging. Carbon dating produced a result that was two centuries older than the cathedral remains should be. But the fabrics in the coffin did exhibit the correct dates. This was puzzling. Sadly, attempts to extract DNA from the bones failed, due to their lack of preservation. But the scientists persevered, now turning to a different technique. And that involved advanced analysis of the teeth found in the coffin. In fact, one of the only parts of the skull found in the tomb was the upper jaw, along with some teeth. This particular technique involved analyzing the chemical compositions, or isotopes, of oxygen and strontium that all teeth contain. These chemical fingerprints build up as the dental structures develop over time and the isotopes vary according to the environment and geological makeup of where an individual has lived. Senior lecturer at Bristol's Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, Dr. Alastair Pike, explained the science on the university's website. Strontium isotopes on tiny samples of tooth enamel have been measured. By microsampling, using a laser, we can reconstruct the sequence of a person's whereabouts, month by month up to the age of 14, he said. The results of the analysis showed that the owner of the teeth had grown up in southern England's distinctive chalklands. This offered firm evidence that the individual grew up in the Wessex region, famous for its chalk deposits. And there were more confirmatory indications provided by dental analysis. As such, the focus of the research then returned to McBurg. One of Professor Alt's research staff, Corina Nipper, analyzed teeth from graves around the German city. The isotopes in the teeth supposed to be Ediths are completely different from those in the people local to McBurg. This individual cannot have spent her childhood in McBurg, the Bristol University website quotes her as saying, and the evidence from the teeth, in fact, matched up with historic knowledge of Edith's childhood in Wessex. Bristol archaeology professor Mark Horton said, Edith seems to have spent the first eight years of her life in southern England, but changed her domicile frequently matching quite variable strontium ratios in her teeth. Only from the age of nine do the isotope values remain constant, Professor Horton went on. Edith must have moved around the kingdom following her father, King Edward the Elder, during his reign. When her mother was divorced in 919, the princess was between nine and ten at that point, both were banished to a monastery, maybe Winchester or Wilton in Salisbury. Meanwhile, Researchers also offered an explanation for the anomalous findings produced by the radiocarbon dating. It seems that Edith had a rich diet high in protein, such as fish, as a child, something that can throw off carbon dating techniques. In addition, the protein-rich diet was also another piece of evidence pointing to an individual from a high-status family. But there was one other anomaly that caught the attention of the researchers involved in the project. In Christian burials of that era, the body was often accompanied by grave goods. There were none in Edith's tomb, however. Nevertheless, 
The high quality of the silk and the dyes used for the shroud were yet more pointers to this being the grave of a person of aristocratic birth. Edith of England, Queen of the East Franks, made an extraordinary journey from the west of England to Magburg, in what is now Germany. Then, after a millennium, her bones returned to England's west country. And the resulting analysis made it as certain as we can be that the mortal remains found in the cathedral belong to her. In October 2010, Edith went back to her adopted home, where she was reinterred in Magburg in a titanium coffin.